consultant and an executive education facilitator. He specializes in digital transformation, agile innovation, user experience, website optimization, mobile marketing, and many more fields. He is the founder and CEO of a London-based consultancy firm, Burn the Sky. He helps global enterprises to develop the skills and capabilities needed to thrive in the digital age. Few of his clients include American Express, Google, HSBC, and L'Oreal. He has helped C-level execs in defining digital capability roadmaps for their teams and develop their skills and confidence around digital transformation. He has the experience of, over two, of training over 2,000 people across 20 countries year on year. Rob delivers transformational management programs in collaboration with Ivy League schools. Rob, we're pleased to have you. Thank you so much for giving us your time today and hosting this session for our learners. Thank you very much, Saranj, for your kind words and for your introduction. And welcome everybody, wherever you are. I hope you're keeping safe in these um, uncertain times and um, looking forward to this session. Perfect. Uh, so dear participants, I'd request you to share your name, your designation and your organization names in the chat segment. We will have an interactive session. So there will be questions, polls uh, and, your, uh, and your queries. You can continue to post them in the chat segment. In the end of the section, in the last 15 minutes, I will take up these questions and Rob will answer each of them. Rob, may I request you to start the session? Yeah, sure, uh, Saranch, and, and thanks again. Uh, again, welcome everyone, and thanks for joining us today. We hope you're keeping safe uh, in these times and looking forward to this session. So, a quick introduction. Uh, as Saranch said, I do three things for a living consultancy, um, digital transformation uh, for various clients. We tend to specialize in financial services, telco utility, and a number of retail clients. Um, Burn the Sky is, is uh, the consultancy that I, I set up 10 years ago to do this. I'm a director with the London Institute of Banking and Finance and advise them on their digital strategy, work with a digital product design specialist, uh, designing digital experiences for clients around the world. Uh, and those are the sectors uh, that we focus on. As you say, I'm mostly on an aeroplane and traveling around the world, although that's changed recently. Exec education, uh, various uh, programs online, of course, to replace the face-to-face -face work in the interim. And the three books, my expertise is mobile. And I've written uh, guides on mobile best practice, mobile strategy, and mobile commerce. So I hope all of this is going to be useful as we go through this program. Please feel, re please feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or to follow on Twitter if you wish to do so. So here are some of the clients. This is just a sample. There are many more. Um, and you can see that we're not limited to Europe. A, a great deal of my work is in the Asian subcontinent, the Middle East and um, the uh, APAC markets. And so that's where my hands-on consultancy comes in. And I hope there will be some value in sharing those learnings with you in this program. As is customary, we ask you please to keep your um, mics on mute raise a hand if you wish to ask a question, but we will be taking questions at the end of each section. Uh, if you can hold off, then it may well be that a question you're planning to ask uh, is answered in the next couple of slides. So it would be my preference that we take those questions at the end of each section, if that's okay. Um, can I just check, Saranj, do we have um, live participants now who are accessing the chat? Yes, Rob, we have a few live participants. Uh, we can wait for a couple of minutes uh, because we still, uh, the traffic is still growing. Let's, let's give, our, give our audience another minute to join in. Another couple of minutes, okay, that's fine. So, well, I'll just put on that slide while we're waiting in case they miss the introduction. I don't see too many numbers in the participants here. It would be good to check also uh, if the sound quality is good and if the visuals are good. 
Perhaps for those of you who have joined us already, you could put a number in the chat. Um, 10 if we're nice and clear, one if it's very pixelated and not so easy to hear. So let's see some numbers in the chat, please. Okay, um, so it appears that everything is working okay from a technical point of view. Uh, Sarah, shall we continue or do you want to wait for some more people? I, th I think we're getting some good responses. We can start. Everybody's rating you eight and 10, uh, okay. picture and audio quality. That's good, okay. So let's get started then. So I'd like to start by assessing from um, the participants on this webinar, what do you want to gain most from this session? Um, and so when you've had a look at this list, I'll read through it now. You could give us a number in the chat and this helps us to focus the delivery in the areas which are of great, greatest need. So number one, grasp the scope of digital transformation for my business. Number two, get inspiration for our digital transformation roadmap. Number three, learn from other participants on this session, on this webinar. Number four, keep up to speed with digital trends and best practices. Or number five, assess feasibility of online learning. So perhaps you could have a look at that and when you're ready, let's see some numbers in the chat and then Saranj, if you could share those back, uh, that would be very valuable. First response comes from Jagat Rathor. Uh, he seems to be very enthusiastic. He wants all one, two, three, four, and five. Okay. Uh, anything more um, uh, directional there? Uh, the next response also, Ziauddin, he also expects all of them. Okay. Uh, so I take it from and anything else which can help guide us about some interests more than others? Uh, Anandya talks about one and five. Uh, NK requests one and four. Sushant requests one and four. Okay, that, that, that helps. So um, let me go through the program. We don't have a lot of time, so this is fairly high level, but I, I hope that at the end of the session, we will certainly have um, addressed one and four. I hope also if you've got a digital roadmap, in development that we can uh, give you some inspiration about how to uh, adapt that and that the very nature of doing this will give you a sense of how online learning is a very feasible and indeed a very uh, uh, effective way of communicating now and in the future. We're going to start by looking at the nature of disruption and I'd like to make the first point that it's very clear that the Technology is ahead of consumers in terms of enabling a truly seamless customer experience at all stages in the journey. Indeed, it is the technology uh, providers and the, um, the digital pioneers, the likes of Google, Apple, Facebook and Amazon, to name but the biggest four, who have managed to uh, leverage the technology in the devices and the, the platforms they've built, which makes it very, very easy for the customer to engage at any time of day or night, anywhere, and pull down relevant content as suits their needs. So consumers are therefore pretty savvy too, because they've been used to using digital technology for a number of years now. And these smartphone devices we have at our fingertips are very, very effective at providing that level of immediacy. Organizations, on the other hand, often struggle. They've got a number of things that get in the way that prevent them from providing the same sort of service that the tech companies are able to deliver. And yet the customers don't really care about that stuff. They just want content as and when it suits them. This guy um, was running one of the most successful businesses on the planet for some time. And I don't know if, if anyone uh, on the call here has um, re recalls uh, using a uh, Nokia handset, if anyone used 
a Nokia, maybe you could just put a comment in the chat, give us a thumbs up to remind us that you did indeed uh, have these devices. We use them um, extensively, tiny screens, tiny buttons. Uh, we used to play a game called Snake, for those of you old enough to remember, uh, and that was as good as it got on a mobile phone back then. Of course, this business very rapidly fell from favor. And I think what's interesting is if you look at the quote here from the former uh, chief exec there, we didn't do anything wrong, but somehow we lost. Now, the important thing is to figure out how a business in such a strong position could so rapidly disappear from uh, favor and indeed disappear entirely. And I would argue that they did two things wrong. First of all, they were absolutely obsessed with what their known competitors were doing, the likes of Ericsson and Motorola, providing a similar service and a similar product and ignoring the real threat, which is of course Apple, who completely transformed the whole mobile marketing experience. Apple they saw as a business that produced iPod music devices, little did they realize they were going to rip the heart out of their business. The other thing they did wrong was to fundamentally ignore some very good ideas that their innovation team had come up with because they were so busy raising their uh, revenues and um, guarding their market share that they didn't realize that the long-term interests of their shareholders and employees was actually rather different from the short-term interest of their shareholders in getting the dividends that they were pumping out uh, so effectively. This guy, of course, revolutionized it all. And I have to give my give thanks. And uh, indeed, I owe my whole life and career to this, this guy who created a, an experience that is so easy and so seamless that anyone of any age can use a device without recourse of a, um, a user manual or some very complex understanding of the technology. The technology apparently is invisible in these devices. The seamless interface between the hardware and the software makes it so easy to access content, to share content. And indeed, he's extended this business, or rather his, his successes uh, have very effectively picked up the mantle and uh, extended the, the shadow, or rather the, the um, vision of Steve Jobs into the future with a number of world-class um, devices. The Apple Watch, of course, provides uh, life-saving utility and information in real time and has, I would argue, been one of the key drivers of the Internet of Things in providing device-to-device -device connectivity. And, of course, the smartphone or smart speaker. I've got uh, an Apple version in front of me here, which allows me to do some pretty clever stuff. So I'm gonna just show you my, my Google version here. Hey Google, what time is it in Mumbai? The time in Mumbai, Maharashtra, India is 18.44. There you go. So uh, I can use voice activation and some very clever technology in order to ask remotely and use this technology connectively to improve my level of knowledge and my utility of this technology. So I don't suppose that uh, Nokia in their wildest dreams would have been thinking about voice activation. They were struggling even with the concept of a smart screen or at least the chief exec was. Today's customer course is very demanding, always on and wanting to connect with um, brands 24 seven wherever they are uh, across the customer journey. Now, it's important that we see this is a two-way experience. I can pull information down 24 seven without going into a branch or recourse call center. But more importantly, I can also share experiences, good and bad. If I have a bad experience and I'm unlikely to get any response from the call center or from the uh, email help desk, I know that by using a hashtag, I can get a very rapid response in order to get a desired outcome. I've done this many times, simply put a hashtag in the social channels and you'll find that someone is on the call pretty quickly wanting to defend their reputation and provide a level of service which you as a customer deserve. Customer experience indeed is a very good place to start with your transformation journey. 
Richard Branson, no stranger to innovation and controversy, uh, makes an interesting point here. The best business comes from people's bad personal experiences. If you just keep your eyes open, you're going to find something that frustrates you. And then you think, well, I could maybe do it better than it's better done, than it's being done at the moment. And there you have a business. Indeed, Branson and many others have carved out very successful businesses and fortunes by simply observing what's being done badly and doing a better job themselves. As well as a bad experience, we can often see a very bad use of data. The vast majority of businesses, this research from Sabre shows us, may have plenty of data, but they're not really doing much with the data. According to this research, 95% of data within organizations remains untapped, often sitting on databases that are not connected and not providing any real-time insights which the business can use in order to improve its customer experience or indeed its employee experience. So why is this? Well, often the data is not collected frequently enough and it's not real-time. Often, Businesses struggle to turn the data into insights, 39%. And it's likened often data to oil. It's the new oil. In its pure form, it's rather difficult to work with, rather difficult to manage. But when processed properly, when refined, we can extract huge value in data and then translate that data into insights, that challenge the BAU way of doing things and can point to some very easy opportunities to improve the customer experience or the product experience. And what we look for when we're delivering our pro programs like this is the disproportionate improvement you can make by extracting one insight, one insight from the data, which will pro prove to you that if you could just change one part of, for example, the onboarding process or one part of the payment process uh, to, to reduce the friction in a checkout on a website, for example, you will be rewarded very significantly by higher acquisition on one end or much better conversion at the other end. But for a lot of businesses, they're sitting on lots of data and they simply don't know what to do with it. Now, there's a lot of data out there. You will have your primary data on your own databases, but there's also a huge amount of data which you can import from third parties. I work very closely with Google. I get to see a lot of data from Google. And what I can tell you without giving anything away here is that there are seven separate platforms Google has developed with over 1 billion active users, 1 billion monthly active users worldwide. Now, when people are using their digital devices, they are showing signals of intent. And if you can understand that intent, you can build some very detailed pictures of who these people really are, what their needs are today. And if you can map that back to what their needs were yesterday, last week, last month, you can very effectively start to predict what their needs are next week, next month. And predictive analytics give you the jump on your competitors because you can be anticipating their needs and providing the services before they even know it. Now, this may sound a little strange, but the data about us is considerably more reliable than what people say in surveys. And effectively, what we have here is a real-time database of seven platforms, each with a billion people. Now, of course, there is some overlap, but we're still talking some big numbers here, which allow us to define and predict intent, consumer intent, which underpins every successful transformation uh, agenda. The digital pioneers are very good at lots of things. And one of the things they're very good at is capturing data, capturing data across all of the different experiences that they have developed, which businesses are able to leverage around messaging, around context, around payments, access through some of the browser-based technologies they've built, cloud-based computing, of course, which allows us to process 
at scale and at velocity, vast amounts of data, and then to overlay machine learning and, and AI-based algorithms to improve uh, what, we, what we can uh, deduce from that data. And then there are operating systems and hardware, all of which are very effective in driving insight and removing guesswork from what we're doing as businesses. Disruption comes in many forms. You can uh, be disrupted slowly and painfully, as indeed the car industry has experienced, where out of nowhere, apparently, we see this business called Tesla and this uh, genius who's managed to you know, put a space rocket up there fairly recently and in parallel run a very successful EV business. This business uh, at its peak valued at over a hundred uh, billion dollars comfortably eclipses the mainstream car manufacturers who've been doing this for over a hundred years. So the question is how has he managed to do it? And I would argue that the real genius here is providing a service, a seamless service, which allows the customer to find a vehicle which is aesthetically attractive, commercially affordable, and build out the infrastructure around that, including the battery technology and the, the delivery uh, functionality that makes this a really viable alternative to internal combustion engines. What I find equally interesting is that another great pioneer, Sir James Dyson, um, has spent over $500 million inventing a prototype for a car and decided to scrap the whole program because he couldn't get a car to market for less than $1,500, which is so $150,000, which is too expensive. So there's something about the disruption that comes from the individual and his vision and something about the technology. So some things are predictable, some things are unpredictable. And of course, the coronavirus has left us all in a very precarious situation where we've been forced to do things that we would not choose to do otherwise, and where we've been ending up doing things, uh, time spent looking at exponential graphs, where we've seen some very rapid growth in an unexpected way. So what we need to do as businesses is be prepared for the disruption, expected and unexpected. And I would expect by now every business, and this survey by McKinsey uh, points to some of the key areas where businesses are focusing their efforts and work streams in order to uh, align their thinking and build in decisioning to tackle a problem which has been so dramatic as coronavirus and build transversal teams to tackle these problems one by one internally. For many businesses, they know they've got to do something, they've got to change, but they just can't figure out how to do it. So what digital demands of organizations is that they move away from this business as usual mindset and move to something far more radical. For a lot of businesses, they can be best likened to a super tank, nice and stable, take a long time to cross the ocean, but they take a long time to change direction. We need instead to start thinking like a startup, thinking like a, a, a fintech, a medtech, an edtech, a business which is driven by data and experimentation. You may see there's an opportunity, quickly spot an opportunity, build a prototype, experiment, bring the findings back, and then scale if they need to, or kill it if the thing doesn't work. So this may be easy to say, but for many businesses, there are considerable barriers in the way. And what we as business people need to do, and what we as, whether you're the chief exec, or you're in charge of sales, or product, or marketing, or human resource capital, we need to identify what the big barriers are to change. When we do our face-to-face -face workshops, we put this chart up uh, in, in our, our sessions we, we tend to ask for questions in the chat here and say what are your biggest barriers to uh, it, to innovation here barriers to disruption and we typically find that it's the same suspects that come up again and again organization structure too many silos people working on their own objectives 
and a lack of aligned thinking. Too many processes, maybe the wrong processes or processes which are redundant that get in the way and prevent people from making quick decisions. A lack of urgency, hey, it can wait. You know, I'm doing my job, my boss doesn't want me to do this thing because he's gonna be shown up for not knowing what he should know and he's, let's put it off till next year. Lack of vision and a fear of failure for a lot of people. Oh, I can't get it wrong. If I get it wrong, I'm gonna get fired. For the innovators, there's no such thing as failure. It's called learning, quick learning. And rather than making mistakes fast, we learn fast. So actually you learn fast if you do things that don't quite work out. That's experimentation. And then there's technology. And of course, behind all of this is skills. And we need to make sure that all our staff are skilled up with the relevant uh, uh, toolkit of processes, frameworks, ways of doing things, and keep their skills up to date. So can I ask now, um, uh, Saranj, do we have any questions uh, from the audience, please? Any questions on that first section? Uh, so, so far we've not uh, got any questions, but we've got some great feedback. Uh, a few people have just said that it's a great session going on. Uh, I think they're understanding. Okay, so uh, if I may then, let me, let me continue. Uh, and we're gonna move on now to look at the key pillars around digital transformation. Now, you know, we run um, transformation workshops and sprints and a whole load of uh, interactions with, with clients that uh, take many days and many weeks. So to try and attempt to do justice to this subject in 60 minutes is, is, is a tall order. But I just wanna to touch on the main points uh, and I hope that this will trigger some thinking around what we need to be focusing our efforts on as we go on these transformation journeys. You know, for a lot of people, when you talk about transformation, they say, oh, that's about technology. Um, if you get the right technology in, then you can do the digital transformation thing. I would passionately take a different view. The technology is important, but the technology can often be used in the wrong way. You need to know what you're doing. When I was in Delhi two years ago, I saw this article in the Times of India. And what this article shows is that the use of technology was not really well thought through and was not well delivered. Zomato, the food delivery company, I'm sure many of you know, maybe you use, uh, had uh, inadvertently uh, imported a comment on a, on a customer's Twitter handle and taking it to be a potential menu suggestion. So when the customer was complaining about the dead roasted housefly uh, on her portion of food, it was then presented back to her as an extra topping. Uh, and I, not surprisingly, the customer was rather upset because this was clearly not a good use of the technology and the machine learning, which should have used that as an alarm bell to fix the delivery problem or the, the, the food uh, production problem, and not instead turn it into some way of recommending a new food idea. Here's a better example. This is a very successful business called the Fart Ocado. It's a food delivery business based here in the UK, but now working internationally. This is a very good business. Uh, they deliver food on time, uh, according to your order. And the people who deliver the food are polite. They are um, very attentive to detail and they get 500,000 emails every week from customers. And most of these emails are positive. I love your website. I have children, so it's easier for me to do the shopping online. Many thanks for saving my time. These emails will get a polite response 24 hours later. However, there may be some emails that complain about the quality of the food, the freshness of the food, the timing of the delivery slot, the attendance and professionalism of the delivery person. These will get an answer in 60 minutes or maybe 120 minutes. What the machine learning tool is doing is looking for the keywords, the keywords for positive experiences and the keywords for negative experiences. And by doing this, we're able to determine which are the most important ones, and then we can reprioritize them <clears throat> in our call center 
in our uh, customer service uh, uh, um, process in order to uh, provide a more efficient business and stop people who may be having a negative experience from putting negative comments on the social channels, which in their own way will be very damaging to our reputation. My argument is not that we should be focusing on the technology alone. Of course, the technology is important, but the technology is an enabler. The bigger focus and the more difficult question is around people. How can we make sure that we understand customer needs? How can we make sure that we understand employee attributes? And how can we build across the business from top to bottom the attributes in our people, the behaviors in our uh, teams, the uh, practices that our management people, our management teams are exercising, and indeed the leadership that uh, we need from the C-level. And often we see in an organization that the very best ideas bubble up from the bottom and some ideas and obviously some investment trickles down from the top. But the problem is, unless the top and the bottom are aligned, the people at the bottom don't feel empowered to come up with their ideas and their ideas, great ideas that bubble up are shot down and they're shot down maybe by managers who don't like to have one of their junior people come up with a good idea, or maybe they're not given the budget they deserve. If you work at Google, you will know that a good idea can come from anywhere. Someone who comes up with a great idea and presents it to their boss is allowed to progress their great idea unless the boss gives them a well-argued reason why they should not do the thing, the project. So the burden of proof is on the boss to say why you shouldn't do it, rather than the employee to put their case forward and show why you should do it. So it's a complete reversal. And it gets me thinking about a very important principle here. A principle we call the power of why. This has been developed by a guy called Simon Sinek. I'm sure some of you will be familiar with Simon. And uh, he's delivered a, an extremely good TED talk and he's written a number of books. And the concept of, of this uh, principle here, the power of why, is that many businesses are very good at telling you what they do, what they do. They tell you what the business is uh, producing, what products they produce and what, um, and you know some of the detail around the product. In the world of Nokia, they would have given you the name of the device, the number of the device, and put in a whole lot of stuff about the device, the what. Some businesses can tell you how they do it, to what are their values, what's their, what's their way of working, how do they engage. Very few businesses can explain why they do it. So I'd like you now to jump in the, um, to jump in the, uh, chat, and I'm going to ask Saranch now if you can share this link, please, Saranch, uh, for the Simon Sinek video. And I'm going to ask if the participants can watch this video. It'll take about four minutes, but I think there's a very important message here, and very few businesses are good at doing this bit. So, Saranch, over to you. Oh, thank you, Rob. Rob, I've just requested my chat team. Uh, to send this link on to the YouTube channel. So all learners, you'll be able to see a link, a YouTube link on the chat. Request you all to watch the video. It's a four minute video. Uh, Rob is going to have certain questions around them. Thank you. So we'll pick this up at the end of four minutes. We'll be back then.
So can I check, Saranj, have we finished watching the video yet? Rob, um, let's wait uh, for a minute more. We've started seeing traffic coming back. Uh, people are saying they're back. Uh, so I'd request everybody, if you've come back, please chat, uh, please type so on the chat window. Can I check, Saranj? Have we finished watching the video yet? So can I request all the Rob, participants? Uh, let's wait uh, for a minute. So if I may continue now, um, our strong view is that if you start with the why, everything else flows from it. When you really understand the mission, the vision that uh, underpins the business Apple, then it just seems very intuitive if they're selling one of these or they're selling one of these or any other device, that it will be great because you just understand how that business operates, its mindset, and it's just a matter of time. They don't need to discount their products. People fall in love with the business. They fall in love with the brand and they come back and they recommend that business to their colleagues, their work colleagues, their domestic colleagues, family, friends. So this is what it's all about, is building a very clear vision the next bit is how we turn that vision into a reality. And this is where we need to challenge the way things are done and move away from uh, a, an incremental, an incremental approach where we're just looking for small shifts and have a much bigger idea, a 10x vision. One of the things that Larry Page has instilled at Google is a sense that you do need to think big, come up with a big idea, not something 10% more, but something 10 times more. Because guess what? If you miss 10%, and maybe you only get halfway there, you get 5%. That's not really a big deal, is it? But if you don't get 10 times, but you get five times more, then that's quite something. So even if you don't get to 10 times, let's aim 10 times. And this is the concept of the moonshot. I'm just going to pass over that the moonshot, the approach that we take is let's define the vision with the power of why. Transform your, your business using data into a clearly defined uh, vision. The next step is to agree what your moonshot is. What is this big 10x idea? A goal that will never be delivered with the BAU approach and something that can leverage transformation technology. And then to make it happen and make it happen fast to find what the roof shot is. So the roof shot is a series of experiments that we need to develop, define clear objectives, clear um, uh, outcomes, allocate resource, internal and external, and bring an agile mindset and sprint methodology to make this happen. So as we look to build on transformation ideas, think big, Start small and move fast. This is the key to doing all of this stuff. It's not a, me a message lost on Jeff Bezos. Our success at Amazon is a function of how many experiments we do per year, per month, per week, per day. Being wrong may hurt you a bit, but being slow will kill you. And we see many examples of businesses that have been simply taken out the game by Amazon because they've been too slow to adapt. You know, you could look at this in the same way we look at dominoes. You need a small one to start and set off a chain of reactions. One domino can topple a domino one and a half times bigger, one and a half times bigger, one and a half times bigger. It's exponential, right? So if you can start with something small that doesn't require board level sign off, huge budget and huge planning, just get started with something small that can trigger a chain. It can build 
capability, proof of concept, and it can build confidence internally that this can be done and is worthwhile, and it can build a strong business case for investment, which of course any innovation requires. And it leads us into an area that for digital and non-digital businesses alike is fundamental to success with your digital transformation. It's about empowerment. It's about empowering staff. This comment from General Electric, I think, is very significant. You have permission to try something new. Don't wait for the invitation. There are a lot of opportunities to grab. If you see a better way, you have an obligation to do it an obligation to do it. So this is a change mindset that needs to be instilled through the business. A change mindset which gives everyone the personal responsibility to change their organization or a part of it. Whether it's improving customer service experience, optimizing some processes, building strong differentiation, or driving incremental revenue and new revenue streams, which unlock new business models, offering platform capabilities, the network effect to bring together a very different ecosystem than the pure buyer seller model, which is now obsolete. And we've seen it with so many examples where the platform is the key to success in the future. So if I was talking to your leaders and I had a cup of tea, these are the three points that I would be making to them. We need a clear vision, a clear definition of the business purpose, communication of vision to all partners internally and externally. We need empowerment. We need to give people permission to challenge conventional thinking and feel like innovation is their personal responsibility. And we need to create and nurture a culture, an open working culture, which rewards experimentation, allowing people to contribute without fear of failure or fear of penalty for coming up with a new way of doing things. Now, if we were doing a live webinar and I knew all the people on this program, we'd now be moving into doing an activity. You know, our strong view is that online learning is all about blending some of the principles, some of the activities to put these ideas into practice and reflection and discussion. And without the holy trinity of those three things, it can be rather difficult to deliver world-class um, online learning, which is what we do. So I would be asking you now as a team to break out into the breakout room or to go into a hangout uh, to use some interactive learning tool, whether it's a, you know, a whiteboard in Zoom or a Jamboard on the Google Suite product and prioritize what are the biggest issues for you in your business. Is it vision and leadership? Defining a clear vision and purpose that is understood by everyone in the business. Is it customer centricity? Making sure that your business is genuinely customer centric rather than product centric. How good is your data strategy? Do you have a data strategy? Do you make decisions based on instinct or based on data? There's a big difference here. Do you have the right mindset, an agile test and learn mindset? And does your business have a culture that rewards experimentation in an agile way? And finally, people and skills. Do you invest in knowledge and skills and empower them to try something new or do you get them to do what they did last year plus 5%? And then to capture these in a, a, a prioritization list. And of course, of course, allow time for ambiguity to a discussion. The volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity, the VUCA world in which we live means that you can't just cut and paste some stuff into a spreadsheet and do it. It is subtle, it is nuanced. We do need to be considering the factors that make this sometimes rather problematic. And so the briefing would continue and we'd certainly bring into the briefing some chat, we'd bring in some whiteboard, we'd get people sharing this with a share back session um, to the rest of the group. Um, so I'd like to summarize before we take questions, if I may, with 
a very fundamental, very simple message here. We need to think big with digital. We can't just do this 5% more thing or what we did last year and a bit more. We need an inspiring vision of the future that's realistic, that's emotionally compelling and memorable. People do not change based on information alone. They change because they are emotionally connected with the vision, which is why the Simon Sinek thing is so powerful. Information helps inform. Inspiration helps transform. Start small, just do it, as Nike would say. Translate that big opportunity into immediate action and build momentum straight away. You don't need to have a huge budget to do this, but just get started. And finally, move fast. Get these rooftop projects agreed. If they're designed and executed fast enough, they will make your vision a reality. So it sounds simple, right? But actually, of course, there are quite a lot of uh, issues and quite a lot of challenges that every business needs to overcome. We share with our learners a whole load of resources. That's just a few examples of things that we would share if we, if we build a relationship. And we're very keen to uh, keep in contact and there are some contact details. So may I ask now, Saraj, do we have any questions? Any questions from the group? We've got about um, seven or eight minutes, so that's long enough to take a few. If you could share those with me, then I'll be able to come back. Uh, so Rob, uh, brilliant session. Thank you so much. We've got some great positive feedback from our learners and our participants. They've absolutely loved the session. Uh, a very insightful session, even for me. Uh, thank you so much. I just want to thank you before I proceed to the questions. The first You're question- welcome. Thank you for your kind words. The first question is from Anandim, uh, Anandim Kusum uh, Mukherjee. Uh, he asks, why do some products of companies like Apple and Google fail miserably? Say Apple TV, Apple Watch, or Google Hangout. Why do they fail? Yes. Um, well, I think it's your definition of failure. Um, I would say that um, I would say it's too early to call on Apple TV. I think there's a, a, a story there which we haven't yet seen in terms of how Apple fully leverages its um, vast global audience and upsells the Apple TV product. I'm doing a digital disruption program at the moment, and that's one of our key, key case studies. I think Apple has stuff that Disney, that Netflix don't have, uh, and it will be very interesting to see if that TV model in some form um, is actually the last, the last man standing in that battle. Um, there may well be some strong collaboration opportunities down the track. In terms of Google Hangouts, um, I use Google Hangouts probably 10 times every day. Uh, I don't think it would be fair to say that that has been a failure, but I would say there are some products which clearly don't work as intended. Take Google Glass, for example, this was uh, intended to be a, a B2C product, having a little camera in the glass that allows people to take photos as they go around. It did not achieve its goal, but there were some valuable learnings. And it's now a very, very successful um, uh, device for those working in the healthcare industry, people doing heart surgery, brain surgery, who don't have use of their hands, can use that to call up images. It's very successful for people working in factories or in the manufacturing sector. Again, you don't have access to hands. So its success has been realized, but not in a predictable way. I should also tell you, uh, by the way, that the prototype for the Google Glass was, uh, it took 15 minutes to construct with a pair of glasses, uh, a, a, a mobile, mobile phone and some gaffer tape. 15 minutes and I met someone who was in the prototyping session, so I can attest to that. So. Uh, I would say be careful, be careful about how we define these things as failures, but I would also challenge your vocabulary. I would say these are learnings and not failures. Any other questions? Yes, Rob, one more question for you. Uh, 
This question comes from uh, Mr. BLN. He asks, uh, in the recent COVID, any examples on how organizations are coping with disruption? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I think every business is, is uh, having to cope with disruption. Um, I find it interesting how some of the some of the global powerhouse manufacturing companies have voluntarily reconfigured their production lines to produce PPE or, or uh, personal protection equipment uh, in order to uh, do their bit to um, fight the the virus and um, support the governments in tackling this pandemic. Um, they've not been forced to do it, but they voluntarily decided to do it. And I think this is a clever strategy because where there is a greater need than market share and, and profit and loss, they will come out the stronger for this, having shown leadership in, in sectors where maybe others are just wanting to offer a few discounts and, and grab a bit of market share. Um, I think on a personal level, if I could uh, respond, uh, our business has had to completely reinvent itself in the last 10 weeks. Uh, that's why we're having this call, why I'm on this call today, by the way, um, because the, uh, the revenue that we've been generating through face-to-face -face programs in 20 countries around the world uh, has just completely disappeared. So we've had to reconfigure our business. And I think with that comes a great opportunity to get rid of the stuff which was not working and replace it with new ways of working, which are indeed more efficient. We have a client, uh, one of our banking clients, uh, they are using this as a, an opportunity to sunset or to stop uh, people in their organization practicing non-competitive and rather antiquated business processes and replace them instead with digital processes and take this opportunity to upskill their workforce, whether they work in digital or not. Oh, thank you, Rob. So Rob, uh, I have two more questions. I think we have the time for two more questions. Um, this is an interesting one by Satish Lal, uh, asking what happens to a company where vision changes with the change of person at the top level? And with this, the empowerment changes uh, as for them. Uh, the culture of the company also changes. So how do you address such a challenge? Well, I think it's inevitable that um, a business, a strong business needs a strong leader and a strong leader needs to have a clear vision um, and that the business needs to expect that a new leader is going to come in and do things differently. Um, I would say that the most effective leaders are those who are very good at listening. Um, if you feel that every idea must start with the leader, and if the leader feels that they, he or she must come up with all those ideas, I would suggest that that person is not likely to be the most successful leader in their sector. Um, I have seen a number of occasions, heard a number of occasions where the way that people talk about leadership is about co-creating rather than telling people what they should do. Uh, the word leadership in my thinking should have a small L, a small L and not a capital L, because it's about leading from behind. It's about encouraging people to think differently, encouraging people to collaborate and support them and be rejoicing when someone in the organization comes up with a great idea rather than wishing it was that person who put their name on it. So ownership of ideas needs to see, in my view, from being a personal thing to a team thing. And people in the organization, wherever they sit, really should be empowered and encouraged to be thinking differently and experimenting, even if it means that the, uh, the payback is not what it could be. And here's a final point I'd like to share. For many leaders, they think that innovation is all about ROI, return on investment. I would say that the real return on investment for innovation is not immediately commercial, it's ideas and it's learnings. And if you can develop strong ideas, 
build prototypes and extract learnings, that will give you far bigger financial results, but not in the immediate future. So are we done or any more? No, Rob, do you have time for one last question? Just do a quick one, yeah. yeah. So this is an interesting one from Sushant. It says, is digital transformation based on historical data and actionable insights? And an extension to that question is, um, how do you pull out yourself from tactical daily activities to start thinking strategically? Well, I think, um, you know, everything we do now should be based on data and insights. You know, it's often said that, you know, oh, the data people, well, that's like the rear view mirror. You're looking in the car to see which way you've come. I don't buy that. The data should be the headlights on the car that tell you where you're going. And so we need to think about how we can be looking forward in a bigger, in a more strategic direction than just getting snarled up in the detail. Now, of course, you have to get the tactics right. The execution there must be flawless. But if you're absolutely absorbed in that, then you're unable to do the most important thing, which is to set the path for the business, a clear strategic direction, which aligns the various different stakeholders behind that strategy. And this is where I think a lot of businesses still struggle because they're desperate to look after the day to day and they lose sight of the much bigger picture and the longer term picture. And it's the visionary leaders who allow and empower their teams to do some of the day to day stuff and free up their own time to think creatively, to reach outside the organization and bring other ideas in. And that will lead to a much more successful outcome and a much more solid digital transformation strategy. Thank you, Rob. Thank you so much. Uh, Rob, I think I won't have time for any more questions. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, your lovely feedback during the session and your questions. Uh, thank you so much, Rob, for taking out the time for us. Uh, it was a lovely session. We enjoyed it. It was insightful. Great. Thank you for your help. Thanks very much to, uh, to you for setting this up. And we look forward to keeping in contact. Absolutely. Pleasure. Bye bye, Keep Rob. Keep safe. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you.